preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hello, good evening, and welcome to our Human Mind series. My name is Susan Engel, and I direct the adult division in the Charles Simon Center for Adult Life and Learning. I'm so glad to see so many of you with us this evening. I'm delighted to welcome back to the 92nd Street Y, a brilliant mind himself, who has made enormous contributions in this area of study. He is a professor of psychology and the director of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at the Massachusetts Institute for Technology. He is the author of the bestseller, The Language Instinct, and tonight comes to talk to us about his extraordinary new book, which has received rave reviews, entitled How the Mind Works. How the Mind Works, which will be available on sale, and our speaker has graciously agreed to autograph copies after his talk. This book is a grand synthesis of our mental life that gives us insights from a variety of disciplines ranging from neuroscience to economics and social psychology. And no one makes this complex subject and subjects such as these so accessible to a lay audience, as well, I might add, so fascinating and interesting as our speaker tonight. Please go join me in giving a very warm welcome to Professor Steven Pinker. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank Susan for her uh, introduction and for the invitation to speak tonight. It's a real honor to speak at this distinguished institution. <clears throat> the human mind is a ma magnificent organ. It's allowed us to walk on the moon, to discover the secrets of life and the physical universe, and to play chess almost as well as a computer. But the mind throws up uh, a number of paradoxes. On the one hand, the human mind is an engineering masterpiece. No robot can see, move, speak and understand, or use common sense nearly as well as a person. You can't go out to an appliance store and buy uh, Rosie the maid to bring her back home to put away the dishes or to run simple errands because the simple mental activities that we take for granted, that we never even think about, such as walking and grasping and understanding, are beyond the uh, abilities of human engineers to duplicate in uh, artificial machinery. On the other hand, the mind has uh, what look like completely irrational quirks. For example, why is the thought of eating worms disgusting? Uh, worms are a perfectly nutritious source of animal protein. Uh, why, do the, why does the male of our species do insane things such as challenge each other to duels and murder their ex-wives? Why do people believe in ghosts and spirits? Why do fools fall in love? Uh, an eternal question. Well, I'm going to try to explain both uh, aspects of the mind, its engineering excellence, and its apparent quirks using three key ideas. The first idea is computation, uh, the, the idea that the function of the brain is information processing or computation. In the same sense that uh, other organs of the body have a function, the heart is there to pump blood, the eye is there to form an image, the stomach is there to digest food, the brain is there to process information. Now, let me say a, a few words about uh, what that means and why this idea is so important. The, there's an ancient problem of uh, what, what is this thing that we call intelligence and how could a piece of matter, such as a brain, achieve it? Well. Uh, intelligence is a notoriously slippery con uh, concept. There's a facetious definition of uh, as that which intelligence tests measure. But I think there's a better way of thinking about what intelligence is. And it comes from the philosopher and psychologist William James, who has a wonderful quote as follows. 
Romeo wants Juliet as the filings want the magnet, and if no obstacles intervene, he moves toward her by as straight a line as they. But Romeo and Juliet, if a wall be built between them, do not remain idiotically pressing their faces against the opposite sides like the magnet and filings with the card. Romeo soon finds a circuitous way by scaling the wall or otherwise of touching Juliet's lips directly. With the filings, the path is fixed. Whether it reaches the end depends on accidents. With the lover, it is the end which is fixed. The path may be modified indefinitely. So that gives us a nice characterization of what we mean by intelligence. It's the pursuit of goals by inference, that is, the use of logic or statistics or knowledge of cause and effect in the world to attain desirable outcomes. And everyday human behavior is certainly guided by uh, goals and knowledge, or as we often call them, beliefs and desires. Uh, even something as simple as, why did Bill just get on the bus? Well, to answer that question, you don't need to stick Bill's head in a brain scanner, and you don't have to run a mathematical model of a neural network. You can just ask him. And he's likely to say something like, well, I want to visit my grandmother, and the bus will take me there. Uh, no other explanation, scientific or otherwise, will do better than that one. If Bill hated the sight of his grandmother, or if he knew that the route of the bus had changed, his body would not be on that bus. But the, this faces us with a problem. Beliefs and desires are colorless, odorless, tasteless, weightless entities, but they are as potent a cause of behavior as one billiard ball clacking into another. This is one part of what philosophers have called the mind-body problem. And I think the theory that the activity of the brain is information processing solves it. The solution is that beliefs and desires are information, and they have their effects through information processing or computation, where information means some pattern in matter or energy that correlates with states uh, of the world. Now, Information, like beliefs, is colorless, odorless, and tasteless, but it's a perfectly precise, tractable, mathematical concept. We call the matter or energy that carries information a representation, and that allows us to give a kind of a simple definition of computation. That's what happens when you build a device so that one representation causes another to arise and the changes mirror the laws of logic, statistics, or cause and effect in the world. The result is that if the old re <coughs> representations were accurate, the new representations are also accurate, and deriving new truths from old truths in pursuit of a goal brings us back to William James's characterization of intelligence. So the concept of computation, uh, I think, explains how a piece of matter can uh, achieve intelligence and therefore solves the one part of the mind-body problem. It's important to note, though, that by saying that the brain performs computation, I'm not proposing that the commercially available digital computer, the, the IBM or the Macintosh, is a good metaphor for the mind, because obviously there are many differences between computers and brains. Computers are very fast. Brains are, are uh, slow. Computers are extremely reliable. Brains are built out of components, neurons, that are statistical and noisy. Computers can only do one thing at a time. Brains can process hundreds of thousands of streams of information at once. Computers display screensavers with flying toasters. Brains don't, and so on. So I'm not denying that there are many differences between computers and brains. However, there may, I, I, will argue that the underlying deep explanation for what makes a brain intelligent is uh, the same as for what makes a computer intelligent, namely the processing of information. An analogy would be that we invoke the same laws of aerodynamics to explain what keeps birds in the air and what keeps airplanes in the air. And in fact, many of the laws of aerodynamics were first discovered in the attempt to build airplanes. But that doesn't mean that we subscribe to an airplane metaphor for the bird and expect the bird to have jet engines and complementary beverage service and so on. Uh, another observation is that the computational theory of mind guides 
brain science, the actual study of the physiology of the brain in wet labs. I'll give you a simple example. The, um, when you teach brain science, there's a, a notion that you have to disabuse students of right away. You, you show a picture of the eyeball, and because of the optics of the eye, the image on the retina is upside down, just because it's a, an optical system. Sometimes a student will say, well, gee, since the retinal image is upside down, but we see right side up, there must be a process in the brain that turns the image right side up so that we can see it properly. Now, uh, everyone who studies the brain kind of laughs at this suggestion. There, doesn't, there isn't a part of the brain that turns the image right side up, and there doesn't need to be a part of the brain that turns the image right side up, because the orientation of the retinal image makes no difference to the way the brain processes information. As long as the consistently one part of the retina always stands for up in the world and another part always stands for down in the world, it doesn't matter physically how it's arranged, it's the information content that counts. Another example is that one of the hot topics in brain science these days is the search for the neural basis of learning and memory. Well, the brain has thousands of metabolic processes. How will we know when we discover the one that's the seat of memory and learning? Well, it's when we find a metabolic process that satisfies the requirements of storage and retrieval of information. Uh, again, it's information uh, and computation that tells us what's interesting in the brain among all of the uh, activities. Finally, the computational theory of mind is by no means trivial or obvious, and in fact, it contradicts probably the main way that we think about the mind in our ordinary conversation and, cog and common sense reasoning. The uh, core of the computational theory is that the mind runs on information. That's very different from the usual metaphor in which the mind is thought to run on energy or pressure. For example, we're apt to explain someone's behavior as follows. If only Fred had an outlet so that he could let off steam, vent his hostility, and channel his rage rather than bottling it up, he wouldn't have exploded last Tuesday and shot up the post office with an Uzi. This is the infamous uh, hydraulic theory of the mind, the idea that our mental life is animated by an overheated vessel of uh, steam or fluid that needs a safety valve. Since we know that the brain doesn't literally have a, a boiler or little pipes that carry steam or fluid, but nonetheless, these, this phenomenon is certainly real. People act as if they're driven by a source of energy or pressure. It leads to an interesting scientific question, namely, why is the brain going to so much trouble to simulate a source of overheated um, uh, fluid or uh, pressure, given that it doesn't literally work that way? And I'm going to return to the reasons why the brain might be running this clever simulation of pressure at the end of the talk. Okay, the second uh, key idea is evolution. Now, how do we understand complex devices in general? For example, how might you uh, try to explain this complex device, which I got in an antique store a number of years ago. I don't know if you can see it. But it's got a bunch of parts, springs and blades and a handle and a little stand. Well, I think you could spend a lot of time just scratching your head and staring at this until someone told you what it was for. That would be the first question you would ask. In this case, as far as I can determine, it's an olive pitter. You put the olive over here, press it down, and the little plunger pushes the pit out the bottom. Um, and once you know that, then everything falls into place. Well, you need a handle to push down and a spring to lift it back up after the uh, olive pit falls out and a ring to hold the olive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this activity is called reverse engineering. In forward engineering, you have an idea for what you want a device to do, and you go out and you build the device. In reverse engineering, you stumble across a device, and you've got to figure out what it was designed to do. So reverse engineering is what the technicians at Panasonic do when Sony comes out with a new product. They run down to Circuit City, buy one, bring it back to the lab, take a screwdriver to it, and try to figure out what all the little chips and gears and pulleys are for. Now, for centuries, the science of anatomy and physiology have been a kind of reverse engineering. 
And uh, scientists have discovered that uh, most parts of the body can be understood as having a set of improbable arrangements that look as if they were designed for some function. The eye uh, has a lens and a cornea, which are highly transparent and are shaped to form an image. There's an iris that opens and closes to let in uh, different amounts of light. There's a layer of light-sensitive tissue at the back of the eyeball, exactly at the focal plane of the lens uh, a few centimeters in front. And it would be impossible to make sense of an organ like the eye without the idea that somehow it looks as if it was designed to form an image. Now, of course, unless you're a creationist, you don't literally think that some intelligent designer fashioned the eye for a purpose, but rather you appeal to Darwin's theory of natural selection, which is our only scientific theory that can explain the appearance of design in the natural world. Darwin showed how if you start off with a uh, replicator, something that can make a copy of itself, then the copies will multiply exponentially, two, then four, then eight, and so on. They will compete for resources in a finite world. Every once in a while, a copying error will crop up. Most copying errors will make the uh, device worse at making copies of itself, but occasionally one will lead to an enhanced rate of replication. Its copies will take up a larger percentage of the next generation when you iterate that process hundreds and thousands of generations of copying, the chance copying errors that happen to increase the copying rate will accumulate. And at the end of the process, you'll have replicators that look as if they had been designed by an intelligent designer for the purpose of survival and replication, whereas in fact, they are uh, the design is an illusion, and they uh, are a product of this mechanical process. Now, the mind is a complex device. I submit even more complex than this gadget over here. And um, a simple proof of that is the fact that we uh, try as we might, we have not been able to build robots that do what minds do, like walk and grasp and talk and use common sense. So that suggests that psychology is a kind of reverse engineering, but a kind of reverse software engineering, figuring out what kinds of computations uh, are installed in the brain and what they're for. Now, in any reverse engineering exercise, the first thing that you need is an inkling of what the device was designed for, as I mentioned. And in the case of the mind, the fact that it's not literal design, but Darwinian natural selection producing signs of design give us, gives us the answer, namely that the ultimate function of the mind is survival and reproduction in the environment in which we evolved, and that would be the tribal or foraging or hunting and gathering environment in which we spent more than 99% of our evolutionary history. Okay, if the first idea was computation and the second idea was evolution, the third idea is specialization. Uh, you'll, I hope, be relieved to know that I, I'm not going to propose a theory of everything. Uh, some kind of wonder tissue or all-encompassing mathematical model that explains everything that a person thinks and feels. Uh, I think that the mind is designed to solve many different kinds of problems seeing in three dimensions, moving arms and legs, understanding the physical world, finding and keeping mates, securing allies, and many others. These are different and in some way incompatible problems, and so the tools for solving them are different. Now, we know that specialization is ubiquitous in biology. The heart is, has a different structure from the lungs because the heart ha uh, is built for pumping blood and the lungs are built for oxygenating it, and a structure that's good at one is going to be bad at the other, and vice versa. This specialization goes all the way down. Heart tissue is different from lung tissue. Heart cells are different from lung cells, and so on. Uh, if so, it suggests that the mind, like the body, may have a complex structure that is organized into the equivalent of mental systems, mental organs, mental tissues, and so on. So to sum up these three ideas, uh, I'm going to suggest that the mind is a system of organs of computation that allowed our ancestors to understand and outsmart objects, animals, plants, and one another. 
And I'll illustrate it with four concrete examples. An example from uh, how we see, an example from how we think, an example from how we uh, develop emotions about uh, inanimate things, and an example of how we develop emotions about other people, where there the story gets particularly interesting because the other people are having emotions back. Okay, let me start out with, with uh, seeing, and um, as before, start out with the idea of what the engineering problem behind vision or v seeing uh, really is. Now, there's a common way of presenting the problem of vision, uh, and that comes from the movies, from science fiction. Often when you've got a seeing robot or computer in the movies, like HAL in 2001 or The Terminator, the director will simply use an ordinary video image, but dress it up in some high-tech way that lets you know that you're seeing the world from the point of view of the robot's brain. Uh, there may be crosshairs or coordinates in the upper right-hand corner or wide-angle distortion or a, a, a red tint. Um, but in a way, this is a, a very misleading um, picture of what the problem of vision is from the point of view of the computer or brain that has to process the world. Because if all you're doing is giving it a picture, you still need something to look at the picture, and there, you can't just install a little man inside the robot's head with a microphone telling the robot what it's seeing. Instead, if you could see the world from uh, the robot's brain's point of view, for that matter, if you could see the world from your own brain's point of view, it would look not like a distorted picture, but more like this. A mammoth spreadsheet of a million uh, values, each of which corresponds to the lightness of one point on the retina. And the spreadsheet of a million numbers corresponds to the two-dimensional projection of the three-dimensional world that's formed when light bounces off objects and is focused to a flat plane on your retina by the lens of the eye. The brain's job is to crunch those numbers and to recover a description of the three-dimensional structure of the world from that two-dimensional uh, spreadsheet of brightness values. Now, the brain has evolved a number of tricks for solving this problem, and one of them can be called shape from shading. It relies on a simple law of physics. The shallower the angle of a surface the, with respect to a light source, the less light it reflects back. Let me just illustrate that for you. Okay, when I aim the flashlight directly at the gray card, you get a nice bright spot of light. But as I angle the card so that the light hits it obliquely, the spot of light is smeared over a greater area. And so in any particular area, it's necessarily dimmer. OK? That's not, that has nothing to do with the brain. That's just uh, how, what, what light does, how light works. Now, a bit of psychology that's evolved to uh, take advantage of this law of physics, runs the law backwards, and assumes that the dimmer the patch on the retina, the shallower the angle of the surface. And by that technique, uh, the brain can reconstruct a complicated three-dimensional surface by uh, basically carving it out of thousands of facets where the angle of each facet is calculated by the how light or dark that particular patch on the retina is. And it's that trick that allows you, say, to see the difference between a ping pong ball and a white poker chip from the subtle pattern of shading that gives away the spherical shape of the ping pong ball, even though you can't literally feel it. But there's one problem with this technique, uh, and that is it makes an assumption about the world. It assumes that the world looks like this, a gray card, that it's uniformly colored or painted or pigmented because in interpreting brightness as coming from angle, so that a brighter spot here means a steeper angle, it's assuming that angle is the only thing that's contributing to fluctuations in brightness. Uh, and is assuming, therefore, that the color, intrinsic coloration, the ink or paint or pigment, is uniformly or randomly distributed. 
Now, this is an Achilles heel of this uh, trick, and it means that surfaces that are colored in clever ways should be able to fool the shape from shading module and cause us to hallucinate three-dimensional objects that aren't there. Well, in fact, this isn't just a theoretical possibility, but it happens every day. One example is television. Uh, when you uh, if you were a, an alien anthropologist from Mars and came down to study the uh, human species, you'd probably be astonished to discover that the typical American spends six to eight hours a day staring at a piece of glass in front of a box. Now, why would we do that? Uh, well, it's because the box has been engineered to display a highly non-random pattern of coloration across the surface of the glass. The brain, which assumes that coloration is uh, random, interprets the brightness changes across the surface of the glass as coming from changes of angle, and so we hallucinate a world behind the pane of glass. Another example is makeup. A skilled makeup artist knows that you can uh, take someone with a big nose and make the nose look smaller by putting some uh, blush on the two sides of the nose. The eye of the beholder interprets darker spot as shallower angle, that makes the two sides of the nose look more parallel, and it makes the look, nose as a whole look narrower. Conversely, if you put a little bit of white powder on the upper lip, then the eye of the beholder interprets lighter patches as steeper, more perpendicular surface, and that gives you that pouty look that the uh, models strive so hard to attain. But th the reason that I mention this example is because it illustrates, I think, a more general point about how we can understand um, uh, human quirks. It may be that many illusions, fallacies, and maladaptive behaviors come from a mismatch between assumptions about an ancestral world built into our mental faculties, such as that the world is randomly colored, and the structure of the current world, such as uh, television or makeup, which are specifically contrived to violate that assumption. So a puzzle for a Darwinian analysis of behavior is, or three puzzles, is why do people do um, maladaptive things like eating junk food, using contraception, which when you think of it is a form of Darwinian suicide, you're preventing your own genes from uh, reproducing, or gambling. Well, it could be that it's because our mental faculties are designed to assume a world in which sweet foods are nutritious, which was indeed true of the world in which we evolved in before the invention of agriculture and then uh, junk food, uh, where the only sweet things uh, were ripe fruit, which indeed were nutritious, a world where sex leads to babies, which again was true until the recent invention of contraception, and so that natural selection merely had to install sexual desire in organisms and the babies would come for free until we severed that cause and effect connection. And where statistical patterns have underlying causes, which again was largely true ex with the exception of devices that are specifically designed not to have predictable causes, namely gambling de devices, roulette wheels, decks of cards, uh, and so on. Okay, I'm going to switch now to an example from uh, thinking. And here the problem that I'll start out with is uh, what do illiterate, primitive hunter-gatherers do with their capacity for abstract intelligence? We know that the human brain is pretty much the same all over the planet and that a uh, native living in a uh, rainforest or uh, in the Arctic Circle has all of the neurological equipment necessary to do calculus or physics, how can we explain where that apparatus came from if there was never an opportunity to show it off and have it translate into more babies? Well, this was a, uh, this in fact led Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of natural selection with Darwin, to defect to creationism late in life and to say, well, the only answer could be uh, God. But I think there is a, an alternative answer, which is that um, the, when you think about it, this question of uh, what do hunter-gatherers do with their capacity for abstract intelligence probably could be posed with more justification by the hunter-gatherers about modern couch potatoes like us. That um, life for our ancestors was a camping trip that never ended except without any of the equipment like the nylon tents and Swiss army knives and freeze-dried pasta. <clears throat> 
uh, our ancestors had to live by their wits in an unforgiving environment. It's unforgiving because organisms in general evolve at one another's expense. Uh, plants and animals are Darwinian creatures, just like you and me, and have no more of a desire to be eaten than you or I do. And so all plants and animals evolve defenses against being eaten. Animals run away or bite or develop hard or spiny coverings. Plants can't very well defend themselves by behaving, so they resort to chemical warfare. And they have uh, evolved a variety of bitter and poisonous chemicals that make them unpalatable to creatures like us who uh, would want to eat them. A way of characterizing uh, what's special about humans is that our ancestors entered the cognitive niche, the ability to overtake other animals' fixed defenses, which can only change in evolutionary time, by assembling sequences of behavior using an understanding of cause and effect in the world. And we see this cognitive lifestyle in even the so-called primitive tribes of rainforests and uh, um, tundras and so on. All human cultures have uh, sophisticated technologies, uh, a variety of tools, a variety of weapons, such as bows and arrows, spears, snares, camouflaged pits, camouflaged cliff tops, poisons derived from plants and animals. All humans deal with plants by detoxifying their poisons by cooking or soaking or drying or fermenting. Humans in all cultures extract medicines from plants and animals to fight the little organisms that uh, eat away at us from the inside. And people everywhere coordinate their actions. They cooperate to bring about outcomes that a single person acting alone could not bring about. So a way of summing up the human uh, condition from a biologist's point of view could be um, had from Ambrose Bierce's The Devil's Dictionary in his dictionary entry for our species. And uh, Bierce uh, defines our species as follows, man, noun, an animal so lost in rapturous contemplation of what he thinks he is as to overlook what he indubitably ought to be. His chief occupation is extermination of other animals and his own species, which, however, multiplies with such insistent rapidity as to infest the whole habitable Earth and Canada. <laughs> now, as a Canadian native, I'm, I'm offended and outraged. But on the other hand, as uh, someone who's looked at the human species, this isn't a bad characterization of our place in nature, unfortunately. Now, the ability to outsmart other plants and animals comes from an understanding of uh, how the world works. The world is a heterogeneous place, and I think that we have installed in our brains a number of different intuitive theories based on core intuitions about how different aspects of the world work. The most basic is an intuitive physics, an understanding of how objects fall, roll, bounce, and so on. The core intuition behind this uh, understanding is that of a stable, law-abiding object, which hangs around even when you don't look at it, and which has behavior that's a predictable response to forces impinging on it. This is by no means an obvious conclusion. William James famously wrote that the world of the infant is a blooming, buzzing confusion, that from the baby's eyes, the world is just a kaleidoscope of shimmering pixels, and that the infant doesn't really appreciate that there are objects out there that give rise to them. Well, since James's time, a number of ingenious experimental techniques have allowed us to actually see what the world looks like from a baby's point of view. And uh, what you can do is uh, take advantage of the fact that babies look longer at things that surprise them, use a little bit of magic, mirrors and wires and so on, to rig up uh, impossible events and see if babies can tell the difference between them and ordinary events. If so, it means they have expectations about how the world behaves. And indeed, from about the youngest age at which you could test babies, three months old, it looks like they have an appreciation that the world is made up of stable objects. They know that one object can't pass through the space occupied by another. They know that one object can't uh, pass behind um, a screen uh, and then come out from behind another screen without passing through the space in between the two screens, and uh, many other uh, bits of awareness of how objects behave. 
way, a way that one psychologist summed up the, this research is that it's the world of the parents of a young infant that's a blooming, buzzing confusion, <laughs> not the world of the infant. But there are some objects that seem to defy the laws of physics. As Richard Dawkins once pointed out, if you were to throw a dead bird in the air, it would describe a graceful parabola and come to rest on the ground, just like the physics books say it should. But if you were to throw a live bird in the air, it would not describe a graceful parabola and come to rest on the, on the ground, but it may not touch land this side of the county boundary. These law-defying objects aren't interpreted by ordinary humans as some kind of miracle or some kind of weird springy object, but as objects that are of a different type and that obey a different kind of law, namely the laws of an intuitive biology. Here the core intuition is very different. It's that living things house some kind of internal essence that supplies it with a renewable source of energy or oomph that gives the animal or plant its form and that drives its growth or bodily functions. And it's no doubt this intuition that's behind the remarkable ability of uh, unschooled hunter-gatherers to be so sophisticated in biology. When professional biologists visit native tribes, they're often astonished to find that they have hundreds of words for the local flora and fauna that correspond almost exactly to the professional biologist's category of the genus or species in the Linnaean taxonomy. This sometimes requ requires uh, defying evidence from your own senses as to what kinds of animals look alike and lumping together animals that look very different but are sensed to share some hidden essence or trait. For example, a caterpillar and a butterfly, or a peacock and a peahen, or a frog and a tadpole. It also allows hunters and gatherers to track and predict. Uh, Hunters are often ingenious at interpreting a few scratchings of, in the ground in terms of what species left those tracks, which way it's likely to go, be going, and when it's likely to stop, and therefore can take a shortcut and ambush the animal at that location. They might remember a particular kind of flower in the spring, return to it in the fall to dig up the underground tuber that they can predict will grow out of it. And they also use the juices and powders of uh, ants and uh, animals and plants to derive medicines, poisons, and food additives. N now this ties into a third way of knowing the world, an intuitive engineering, an appreciation of tools, artifacts, and man-made objects. Now our species, Homo sapiens, is famous in uh, the uh, biological world for depending so much on uh, tools that it fashions for itself. And the understanding of the concept of a tool must be behind that. There we've got a third kind of core intuition, namely function, what someone intends an object to do. Take a, a category of man-made objects such as chairs. What do all chairs have in common? Well, it's not the stuff they're made of, unlike plants and animals, because chairs can be made out of anything. And it's not their shape, because you can have a, a chair that's uh, a three-legged stool, or a high-back dining room chair, or a beanbag hammock, a uh, severed elephant's foot, a tree stump. Any of these things can be chairs as long as someone intends them to be used for holding up a human behind. <laughs> Finally, we have a way of dealing with other people, an intuitive psychology, where the core intuition is different from the first three, namely that behavior is caused by beliefs and desires, namely the kind of common sense explanation that I gave earlier for Bill getting on the bus. Uh, young children show an appreciation of uh, the fact that you can predict other people's behavior only by figuring out what they're thinking. They track uh, other people's eyes and deduce that the people want what they're looking at. And uh, they also make distinctions uh, between living and non-living things, which you can, you can detect using some of the techniques that I mentioned earlier. For example, if you show a baby one object bumping into another and launching it on its way, they'll look for a moment or two and then tr turn away because that's a, a run-of-the-mill everyday event. If you show them an object stopping short and then at that precise moment another object being launched, they stare much longer because that defies their intuitive physics. 
Now, replace the objects with people, and the intuitions reverse. Babies are not at all surprised when one person stops short and another one moves. What surprised them is if one of them collides into the other and sends them on his way. So infants show this distinction between uh, biological objects, such as which move on their own, and physical objects, which have to be launched. And there are other kinds of evidence that the mind really is divided into these different discrete ways of understanding the world. One example comes from, well, one kind of evidence comes from neurological and genetic dissociations. There are some patients who've uh, lost part of their brain from a stroke or other head injury who no longer have the ability to name living things like fruits, vegetables, and animals, but have no trouble naming man-made objects such as furniture and tools. There are other patients who suffered different damage to different parts of the brain who have the reverse syndrome. And this suggests that man-made objects or tools and living things are stored in different ways in the human brain. The condition, probably genetic, called autism is well described as a deficit in an intuitive psychology. And unlike normally developing children, autistic children tend to treat other people without an, a, a, ascribing beliefs and desires to them. They treat other people as if they were physical objects or big wind-up dolls and don't appreciate that other people uh, have, are moved by their beliefs and desires. But one of the most interesting ways of seeing the distinctions among these faculties comes from cases in which people misapply them, where they take one way of knowing the world and apply it to an aspect of the world that it wasn't designed for. One example is slapstick humor, where we laugh when someone slips on a banana peel or gets bonked by a board being carried by a carpenter. That's a case where we're forced to make a sudden shift between conceiving of people using our intuitive psychology, that is seeing them as a mind with beliefs and desires, and suddenly seeing them as objects in ignominiously obeying the laws of physics. A belief in souls and ghosts and spirits and so on uh, can be seen as our intuitive psychology running amok and conceptualizing pure minds that aren't rooted in bodies. Animistic beliefs, where people believe that trees or mountains or idols <coughs> have minds, is a case of the opposite of illicitly marrying intuitive psychology to intuitive biology, physics, or engineering, and uh, thinking of living things like trees or natural things like mountains or artifacts like idols as if they had minds. Okay. Oops, I'm going um, to. I'm going to turn now to emotions about things, and I'll, I'll use as my example a, an emotion found in all human cultures that's instantly recognizable from a characteristic facial expression, namely disgust. Okay, you all know what it is. Uh, and there are, like other emotions, it has a particular set of stimuli or things in the world that trigger it. <clears throat> and um, in the case of disgust, there's actually a rather long list of potential triggers. And I've collected, uh, I've found a number of them collected in the lyrics to one of my favorite songs. Uh, many of you no doubt remember it from Camp. Uh, it's sung to the tune of the old gray mare. Its lyrics are, great green globs of greasy grimy gopher guts, mutilated monkey meat, concentrated chicken feet, jars and jars of petrified porpoise pus, and I forgot my spoon. Now, it turns out that this, is, this list doesn't even begin to exhaust the set of things that can disgust us. And as I've given this talk to various college campuses, inevitably students will come up to me afterwards and say, you know, when I was in camp, we used to sing it with the following lyrics. And I've been collecting a number of them. French fried eyeballs, little birdies dirty feet, chopped up baby parakeet, perforated pony's feet, on and on and on. Well, the conclusion is that just about anything that comes from an animal is a potential stimulus for disgust, and it's something that we don't want to touch or eat. Basically, whatever is not permitted is forbidden, except for a very tiny list of acceptable animal parts that varies from culture to culture. Everything else is uh, revolting. 
In our culture, it basically is confined to the skeletal muscle tissue of cattle, swine, fowl, and fish. Any other body part, such as brains, testicles, eyeballs, and so on, are forbidden. And any other animal not on the list, slugs, uh, monkeys, uh, insects, frogs, etc., are also uh, revolting in our culture. In different cultures, the list is different, but in all cultures, there are various taboos uh, of food backed up by this emotion of disgust. Now, at first, this seems uh, irrational. Uh, because we're throwing away so many potential food sources, but the psychologist Paul Rosen has reverse engineered the emotion of disgust and showed that it's a solution to what he calls the omnivore's dilemma. Now, there are some animals that are dietary specialists that subsist on only one food, such as koala bears with their eucalyptus leaves. The problem they face is that they have to go hungry if the food they depend on becomes scarce. Humans are omnivores. The advantage is that we have a vast menu of potential foods to select from. The downside is that many of them are poison. There are uh, many insects and invertebrates house uh, deadly neurotoxins. And even ordinarily safe foods can become dangerous if they spoil, as we've recently been reminded by all of those uh, draconian warnings from public health officials as to how to uh, you know, soak our kitchens in bleach so that we don't get salmonella poisoning from our next chicken salad sandwich. Now, the potential contaminants differ from uh, environment to environment. Uh, when I go to England, I stay away from the beef because I don't want to get mad cow disease, uh, but I don't have any problem eating it here. And that means that there's a learning problem that you've got to figure out which foods are safe in your local environment. The learning technique that seems to have been installed in us is to um, use our parents and friends as we grow up the way kings used to use food tasters. Namely, if they ate a morsel and didn't keel over dead, that means that it must be safe to eat. Everything else is guilty until proven innocent. Now, there's another feature of disgust that I'd like to illustrate. But first, I'm going to take, um, I want to take a very short break. Uh, it's been a long day, and I've been droning on. And even I'm starting to get bored by my own voice. So I think I could use a little pick-me-up. And I, I brought myself a nice cup of coffee here. Uh, I take it with a little bit of sweetener. And, uh, oh, damn, I forgot a stirrer. Ah. Now, if I offered you this cup of coffee, which I've just stirred with my comb, I think most of you would quickly lose your appetite. Even if it was a yummy uh, mochaccino from Starbucks, um, the idea that it was even touched by a comb which touched uh, my scalp would be enough to make you lose your appetite. This uh, indicates another feature of the emotion of disgust, namely contamination by contact, or what children call cooties. The intuition that invisible contaminating bits are transferred from object to object by the slightest touch, and therefore the object is permanently tainted. It's a kind of voodoo psychology that's installed in each of us. And any of you who read a little bit too much can often get the willies at things like using a public phone or holding on to a strap in the subway if you think about what other people who have touched it have touched before. Uh, it's very easy to get people to become phobic with uh, money and uh, all kinds of other objects. Um, I'm sorry if I'm doing it to all of you. Uh, now you can call and wake me up to punish me. But um, the thing is that this intuition is uh, not as irrational as it might first appear. Because in a sense, children are right. There are cooties. They're what we call microorganisms, germs. And unlike chemical poisons, such as what you might find in plants, um, there's an unusual feature of microorganisms as a contaminant, namely, they multiply. That's what living things do. So what starts out as one germ then becomes two, and then four, and then eight, and then 16, and then 32, and in a short period of time can saturate and contaminate a substance of any size. So this suggests that the uh, 
component of the emotion of disgust that uh, responds to contamination by contact may actually be a kind of intuitive microbiology that we uh, all evolved with before the actual discovery of germs by Pasteur. Finally, I'm going to talk about emotions about other people. And there the chief puzzle is why our emotions about other people tend to be so passionate and seemingly irrational. Examples are pursuing vengeance uh, until uh, following someone to the ends of the earth, uh, challenging someone to a duel if they besmirch your honor, dissing the guy who, uh, I mean, stabbing the guy who disses your sneakers, uh, falling head over heels in love and offering to slay dragons and buy extravagant gifts and so on. Why uh, do people um, get, lose control to their passions? Well, the main theory that I think all of us intuitively believe is the romantic theory from the romantic movement in England, France, and Germany a couple of hundred years ago, namely that we all house a primal force, part of our heritage from nature, that it's fundamentally irrational and maladaptive unless it's channeled into art and creativity. And this ties into the hydraulic metaphor uh, that I mentioned at the outset. I'm going to argue for an alternative, the strategic theory, which says that passion is a what uh, game theorists call a paradoxical tactic, a case in which a sacrifice of freedom and rationality actually give you an advantage in promises, threats, and bargains. And just to show you how unromantic this theory is, I'm going to illustrate it by reverse engineering romantic love. Now, romantic love has been studied by social scientists for decades, and there's one conclusion that's agreed upon by social scientists and veterans of the dating scene. Namely, love is a marketplace. We, at some point in our lives, we are all in search of the nicest, smartest, richest, best-looking person who will settle for us. Uh, but on the other hand, your Mr. or Ms. Wright is a needle in a haystack, and you might die single if you wait indefinitely for that person. So at some point, everyone has to uh, basically set up house with the best person that they've found so far. Now, this uh, gives rise to the phenomenon at um, a very well documented called assortative mating by mate value. Basically, in any the husband and wife or the boyfriend and girlfriend are approximately equally matched on overall desirability as if each was shopping for the best that they could get. But I don't have to remind you that there is something about love that this smart shopping account leaves out. All of us uh, know people, in fact I'm sure many of us are people, who can remember getting fixed up with someone that on paper seems like the ideal mate. You can tick off all the qualities, yeah, they're good looking, nice, stable, rich, etc. But when you meet the person, something doesn't click. Uh, Cupid doesn't strike, the earth doesn't move, and so on. There's an, uh, an involuntary component to love. You can't will yourself to fall in love with someone. And there's an element of caprice. No one can really predict who someone else will be attracted to. And again, that leads to the question, uh, why? Why are we so constituted? Well, the economist Robert Frank has, uh, I think, shown that there's an inherent problem for the purely rational strategy, the smart shopping strategy, which economists call the commitment problem. Romance is a kind of promise. You're promising to forsake all others and to uh, bring up children with the other person for the rest of your life. Now, there's an inherent problem with all promises, namely that a rational agent might find it in his interest to break the promise in the future, and therefore the promise is, uh, the problem is how to make your promise credible so the other person will uh, agree to it to begin with. In the case of romance, the uh, fact that everyone has to uh, settle for the best person they found so far, means that according to the law of averages, someone better is bound to turn up sometime in the future. 
At that point, if you were following the purely rational strategy, you would dump your uh, mate like a hot potato, say when uh, Tom Cruise or Cindy Crawford moves in next door and is momentarily available. Since a, your hypothetical rational partner could anticipate that at the time at which you were wooing him or her, they would be crazy to have entered the relationship to begin with because breaking a relationship involves irretrievable costs. You've forsaken others, there, so there are opportunity costs. You may have given up your apartment, sold your stereo, and so on. And so with two perfectly rational agents, neither one of them can trust the other long enough to set up a relationship that's in their both, both of their best interests. Well, the one solution would be if you don't decide to fall in love with, for rational reasons, you can't decide to fall out of love for rational reasons, or at least you're less likely to. And this would suggest that romantic love is a kind of guarantor of the implicit promise in a uh, romantic relationship. It's one of the cases where lack of freedom and rationality is an advantage. There are many analogs from the literal concrete world of laws and contracts. For example, the law that empowers the bank to foreclose on your mortgage and repossess your house takes away from your freedom, namely your freedom to live in your house and to break your promise to pay back the bank loan. On the other hand, it's only that law that made it worth the bank's while to loan you the money to begin with. And so, paradoxically, that law works to the advantage of the borrower. Another example is the feature of the law that sets up and defines uh, the rights of corporations that says that corporations have the right to sue and the right to be sued. The right to be sued? What kind of a right is that? Well, it's the right to enter into a promise with a party that has the potential to be harmed in the future, and therefore it's the only way in which a corporation can make a credible promise, namely enter into a, uh, certain kinds of contracts. Now, what's the evidence that romantic love uh, evolved to have this function? One of them is simply the fact that romantic love is a universal human emotion. It's part of our normal neurological equipment. This is actually a radical conclusion in today's intellectual climate. Most intellectuals believe that romantic love is a recent invention or a social construction coming from Hollywood scriptwriters or Harlequin romance novelists. Uh, in fact, a recent cross-cultural survey has uh, combed over the anthropological literature and has found that something like romantic love exists in all human societies in all periods in history. I think the reason why the reality of romantic love was uh, denied is because romantic love is a nuisance to parents who would just as soon uh, trade their children or sell them in arranged marriages. If a child runs off after a soulmate, that could spoil the deal of a century. And so parents uh, and the establishment in general always has it in their interest to spread the disinformation that romantic love does not exist. But it's, ex it's propaganda, romantic love does exist. A second bit of evidence is simply looking at the dynamics of courtship strategies. If you were to whisper in your lover's ear, uh, you're the uh, nicest, best looking, smartest, richest person I've been able to find so far, uh, it would probably kill the romantic mood. Um, by the way, when I gave this talk at an MIT faculty seminar, one of my fellow professors at this point in the talk went, that's what I've been doing wrong. The way to someone's heart is to declare the exact opposite. I love you only because you're you. Uh, I like the way you walk. I like the way you talk. Furthermore, it's involuntary. I can't help falling in love with you. You can fill in the rest of the lyrics yourself. Uh, what you do is you call attention to the fact that this is an emotion triggered by the uniqueness of that individual as opposed to a list of their qualities and that it is involuntary. Uh, and that you haven't talked yourself into it and therefore can't be talked out of it. Finally, it accounts, I think, for why so many of the emotions are accompanied by involuntary physiological um, symptoms, signals really to other people. When we're in the throes of passion, we 
sweat and shake and blush and blanch and our voice cracks uh, and we tremble and so on. And what I think we're doing is broadcasting to an audience the fact that our current course of action is under the control of the involuntary components of the nervous system, the parts that control heart rate, breathing, skin circulation, and so on. And that is a way of indicating in some expensive way that the current course of action is uh, sincere and it isn't something that the rational cognitive part of our nervous system has uh, talked us into. Now, if passionate love and loyalty are guarantors that our promises are not double crosses, you can also understand passionate vengeance and honor and anger as a guarantor that our threats are not bluffs. There's a problem with issuing a threat namely that uh, someone might call you on it. And carrying through or enforcing a threat can often be costly to the person who has to do it. The other person might fight back. It might hurt you more than it hurts them, and so on. Since the target of the threat can predict that, they are in a position to threaten you right back by calling your bluff. On the other hand, if you're so constituted that it's an intolerable insult if someone crosses you or defies you, and you're going to pursue vengeance and punishment regardless of the costs to yourself, then that means that you're the kind of person that other people don't want to mess with. The, um, this logic, again, somewhat paradoxical, was beautifully illustrated. It's often illustrated in fiction. But my favorite example comes from The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett. In the um, episode, uh, in the movie version, there's Sam Spade, uh, played by Humphrey Bogart, and Casper Gutman, played by Sidney Greenstreet, in which uh, Sam Spade dares Gutman to kill him, knowing that Gutman needs him to retrieve the falcon. And so S Sam Spade assumes that he's safe, that he can't be killed. And Gutman replies, that's an attitude, sir, that calls for the most delicate judgment on both sides. Because as you know, sir, in the heat of action, men are likely to forget where their best interests lie and let their emotions carry them away. Uh, an effective riposte and a wonderful illustration of the paradoxical advantage of being uh, at, at times irrational. OK, I'm going to conclude now. Um, it may seem like the uh, particular picture of the mind that I've been describing is a kind of cynical view. And most people don't really like the idea of thinking of themselves as a system of computers designed by natural selection to promote survival and reproduction. On the other hand, I think there are key elements of this view that simply can't be denied uh, it, by a, any scientifically literate person. I don't think it's deniable that the mind is a product of the brain that the brain, like other organs, is a product of evolution, and that evolution is not guaranteed to produce niceness. On the other hand, um, I don't think it's that cynical a view. And I think, in fact, that it um, offers scope for a certain amount of hope and optimism compared to some of the alternative ways of thinking about Homo sapiens' place in the biological world. The idea of computation implies that the human mind is not just a set of crude drives and reflexes, uh, but intricate, ingenious, and powerful software. The idea of evolution suggests that the, our legacy from natural selection is not just greed, aggression, lust, territorial imperative, a rapacious sex drive, and other uh, ugly urges but that by the same token, love, friendship, and a sense of justice are our legacy from uh, the biological world. Finally, the idea of specialization, uh, the idea that the mind is a complex system of interacting parts, suggests that some parts of the mind, the ones with a longer view of the future, can devise ways of outsmarting the darker parts of the mind. Thank you very much. And uh, now I'm, I'd be happy to take questions that may, may have popped up. Yes? I'm 
Yes. The question is, um, how useful is the notion of meme in explaining behavior? Meme is, was coined by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene, and it refers to some element of culture that replicates in the same way that genes replicate and that spread from mind to mind in the same way that genes are transmitted from body to body or, or the, the germs are transmitted from host to host. And the idea is that some of our cultural evolution might be explained not in terms of the fitness of people, um, but who have ideas and melodies and artistic motifs and beliefs and so on, but the fitness of the beliefs themselves. You treat a belief as if it was a reproducing organism, and then you understand why some memes like catchy songs or uh, irrational religious beliefs are so widespread, not because uh, there's a part of the mind uh, that generates religion, but because the religious belief itself is like a dangerous virus that spreads. I mean, I think there's some, uh, th there's a, a lot of merit to the idea, uh, and I think, though, that I think, though, that it's best at explaining why some things become numerically popular or unpopular, and is not as good as at explaining the actual structure of the particular ideas. That is, how a melody arose to begin with, how someone put together a story. And I do talk about memes in, in the book in, in a way of, I think, d kind of downplaying them, because they take it for granted that the mind is capable of understanding a story or composing a melody and appreciating the melody and then singing it to someone else. And that complexity is really what my focus is, is on. Uh, if you didn't have a mind that could form melodies or understand sentences, then the meme would be stopped in its tracks. And that means that I think the biggest part of the story is how memes are created to begin with, not simply how they become numerically more or less uh, prevalent. Yes? What explanation would you give for the delight that's obviously expressed in the, in the disgust of the lyrics that you put up there? What does that produce? Yes, where, where does the delight come from in defying, um, in sort of defying your sense of disgust? And I mean, this is great fun to sing this song when you're a kid. Um, again, I think Rosen talks very insightfully about a whole family of phenomena like that, which he calls, um, what's the word? word? Um, benign masochism, cases in which we deliberately bring on uh, or um, allow negative stimuli to impinge on us in controlled doses. So sort of gross out humor is an example, sitting in saunas, eating hot chili peppers, uh, going to um, uh, reading tear jerkers, uh, going to thrillers in the movies, uh, skydiving, uh, spelunking, and so on. There's a very large class of activities. Um, I think the explanation for those, or if, if we have an explanation, is that um, if you, that in any negative emotion, any emotion that makes us avoid things, there's the benefit of not being harmed by the dangerous stimulus, but there's also a cost if we are so phobic and so avoidant of everything in our environment, of everything that could be contaminated or could be dangerous, that, I mean, there's a, you can go to the other extreme and just cower in your cave because you might get eaten by a tiger or might contract a disease if you step out of it. And so there's, I think, a motive to push your own boundaries, that is to, as Tom Wolfe said, to push the outside of the envelope and see how much of a dangerous or noxious stimulus you can tolerate without it actually doing harm so that you can push the boundaries of your own negative emotions and not suffer the costs of avoiding everything. And so things like um, physical exhilaration from non-competitive um, sports, um, uh, ordinarily repellent substances like, like um, uh, smelly cheese and hot chili peppers are basically a way of expanding your options in life. Obviously not going all the way and you know, sticking needles in your eyes for the fun of it, but tiny measured doses that allow you to see exactly how close to the boundary you can get. That's probably enough, that's probably true. That there's also a kind of um, a machismo in being able to tolerate 
um, what everyone else sees as you know, dangerous or re repellent situations. And it may also be a way of showing how tough you are uh, it, to the extent that it's done conspicuously in public, as this song is. So your explanation may actually be the more important component in these public displays. It's a good point. Yes? Yeah, the question is, what credence would I give to Freudian concepts? I think a lot of Freudian concepts are, are strikingly incompatible with this view. Uh, the idea that, um, uh, that boys have a desire to copulate with their mothers, um, and the idea that they're afraid of being castrated by their fathers, uh, and so on. Um, I think the hydraulic model, which is really the basis of Freudian theory, is also uh, wrong. Um, but I think there are some aspects of, uh, that Freud noted. He was a, a very insightful observer of human nature. One of them is certainly the idea that there's a, um, there is a distinction between conscious and unconscious beliefs. And um, I think, though, and that there are defense mechanisms where people are, feel an acute discomfort and devise ways of uh, perhaps reconciling a painful unconscious belief with an appreciation of reality. But I think the explanation is very different. And it comes from Robert Trivers, the uh, biologist, in his theory of self-deception, which is that since it's, we all have uh, something of a motive to lie about how honest and true we are. Um, and it's hard to tell lies, because everyone else is kind of a walking lie detector. So the best way to convince someone else of your lie is to believe it yourself. Um, and so we are all deluded about how smart, how strong, how good, how honest, how independent, how generous we are. This has been documented beyond reasonable doubt in the social psychology lab. Um, on the other hand, there is some advantage also to knowing the truth, just because otherwise you're completely out of touch with reality and you don't know how to change yourself in cases where that isn't called for. So Trivers uh, proposed that the part of the mind that's in contact with voluntary behavior and speech and interactions with other people has a kind of uh, advertising manager's view of the self, sort of puffed up with all kinds of uh, lies. But then deep down, there's another part of us that's a little more in touch with our own limitations. And indeed, I think a lot of the, the Freudian defense mechanisms, such as denial, um, repression, projection, reaction formation, can be ways of um, fending off blatant evidence that the conscious beliefs are, in fact, false. And a simple phenomenon that I, I talked about in the book is the one that we've all had of uh, being stung or by a remark or being cut by a uh, bitchy or negative remark. Well, when does that happen? It's not when someone says something that's completely false about you, because then you can just brush it off. And it's not about something, generally, about something that you are happy to acknowledge. If someone's told me that I was a, a klutz, um, I wouldn't be terribly upset, because I know I'm a klutz, and I would tell any, everyone that I'm a klutz. But if they said something about you know, the quality of my work or teaching, and it maybe had some little element of truth in it, then I'd be really upset, because that's exactly the kind of knowledge that part of me obviously registers, but that the public part of me would rather keep under wraps. So I think the uh, Trivers reevaluation of Freud's theory is, makes a lot more sense, but it does acknowledge that Freud really did hit on something uh, in human psychology. Yes? Well, it's, um, we don't really know. The, the mere fact that they can do it at three months doesn't establish that it's hardwired. Um, in fact, it almost certainly isn't hardwired in the sense of being um, unchangeable or present at birth, although it may be installed at, um, in the first three months because brain wiring continues to, to take place after birth. The reason that the, um, I, I think that it comes from some kind of um, um, 
in, inherent or innate program um, that wire, that's wired in the brain is that it's three months is basically when the visual system first starts to function. It's really when babies can first start to see properly. And it's an age in which they um, can't really move uh, voluntarily. Babies can't even reach until about four months. Uh, they can't walk around. They don't understand language. And uh, they haven't really been focusing clear images of the world up to then. So as soon as they can see anything, they seem to um, be uh, cognizant of these physical constraints. So it, it suggests that it's part of the uh, baby's mental apparatus. Also, if you try to think about how we could, babies could learn about objects, which they obviously have to do. I mean, babies aren't, can't be born with innate knowledge of you know, sponge rubber and Velcro and fishing line and so on. Uh, you've got to learn these one by one. But unless you had the core intuition that there are stable objects in the world, you could just see the world as a hallucination of flowing colorful patterns all your life. So I think the, um, what you need to get learning started is some kind of conceptual hook on which to hang the information that you gather from the world. And indeed, there's, I mean, I shouldn't, I don't want to exaggerate, there's lots that babies don't know at three months, including uh, gravity, which they have a very tenuous appreciation of. Yes? How do I explain consciousness? Uh, consciousness is a word with many meanings, and so the explanations would be different depending on what sense of consciousness you have in mind. Just the English language just doesn't have enough different words for these different concepts. One concept of consciousness is, the, is Freud's distinction between that which we can easily talk about and that which is going on in the brain that we don't uh, have access to. And that, I think, can be explained straightforwardly as um, either in the in the Trivers case, self-deception, or in other cases, such as when we, you, uh, I can't tell you exactly how my muscles move or how I'm putting words together into a sentence or how I'm processing colors. It's just that there's some kinds of computation that are kind of sealed off in submodules uh, and that are uh, made not to interfere with the central processing of uh, everyday planning and problem solving. So I think that's a, uh, a question of um, just the engineering design of a, the computational functions of the brain. There's another completely different sense of consciousness as um, the fact that we see and experience and feel things at all. That is the difference between a, a human and an android that's rigged up to behave exactly like a human, but where there's sort of no one home who's actually feeling anything. Now, this is really almost more of a philosophical problem than a scientific problem. Uh, there are some, uh, and it's been played out endlessly in science fiction. Um, there was an episode of Star Trek where the debate was whether they could disassemble Lieutenant Commander Data to figure out how he was built or whether that would be tantamount to murder. Uh, there's an episode in um, the Twilight Zone where uh, a prisoner has to leave behind a, a robot that he's fallen in love with and, uh, you know, can you just junk this hunk of machinery uh, or does it, the fact that it behaves like a human mean that it has feelings? And these are, there's something infuriatingly unresolvable about these kinds of questions. Would a computer be conscious? Are worms conscious? Uh, are, um, you know, are you conscious? Might you just be a robot or a zombie? And that's led some philosophers to say that the whole business is a mistake and that we're, the whole notion of consciousness in that sense is just a blunder. There is no such thing. We are all robots. Uh, and because there's no scientific, testable way to study this inherently subjective quality. Now, I wouldn't go that far because uh, I know what it's like to be me. I know, I know I'm not a robot. Um, and there is, I think, a real intellectual problem there. It's not meaningless. On the other hand, I actually agree with those skeptical philosophers that it may not be a problem that we can solve scientifically because science has to be driven by uh, observables and by definition, 
consciousness in the second sense is that which we can never experience uh, of another entity or of another person. So my own uh, feeling is that the first sense of consciousness is a perfectly tractable scientific problem. The second one is one that, um, that I don't have any answer to and that I suspect the human mind isn't designed to comprehend. So we may permanently be in the dark about the philosophical sense. It may be the kind of thing that's explored in Star Trek and in college dorm rooms at 3 a.m. Uh, forever. Right. Yes? Well, the soul would be, uh, is, it's basically the same question. That is, if you believe that our consciousness comes from the soul, uh, then the question uh, it really boils down to the same thing. I don't believe in the soul in the sense of some extra substance or ingredient that's kind of injected into our brains and that leaves it when we die. Uh, I think that consciousness, even in this philosophical sense comes from the activity, physiological activity of the brain. Uh, we just know this because anything, there can, that without a brain there is no soul. I mean, unless you believe in seances and communicating with the dead and so on, I think there's excellent reason to believe that when the brain dies, the soul dies. Uh, we know that anything you do to the brain, uh, cut out a part of it, Part of the soul is gone, the, the person uh, no longer feels something or sees something or uh, understands something. If you change the activity of the brain with chemicals by taking psychoactive drugs, the experience changes. You look at the brain under the microscope, it's got the kind of breathtaking complex, physical complexity that you would need to support something as complicated as thought and feeling. So I don't believe in a soul in the sense of something extra you need above and beyond the brain. On the other hand, I am willing to concede that why this fact is true, namely neurons firing, spraying chemicals at each other, causes this extra ingredient of subjective inherent consciousness is not one that, that I can solve and not one that anyone has yet solved and maybe not one that anyone ever will solve. Okay, two more questions. If I neglected some part of the room, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, you. Um, I read about oh. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, if, certainly if you put on prisms that um, turn the world upside down, um, what, and I, I've, I've put them on. I mean, you start off, uh, you know, if I were to reach for this cup of coffee, I'd go like that. And then find, kind of have to relearn to move my hand down to grab it. And people get to be quite good at it. They, you know, they can, after a couple of, uh, typically after more than 48 hours, you can do things like ride a motorcycle and drive and so on. Um, I think what's happened there is that you've, you haven't literally turned the world right side up because it doesn't go through intermediate stages in which it's sort of 45 degrees and then sideways and so on, but you relearn the mapping between motor space and visual space and you um, basically, your brain has circuits that map points in visual space to motor trajectories and you realign those. Uh, so, um, and there's, there is a time course and it depends on, there's a component that's kind of almost like geometric relabeling of the axes and another component that's specific to the actual limb that you use. Um, so, uh, and I think the reason that we have that adaptability is that we, we grow uh, and our muscles get stronger and weaker and um, the, as we grow, we've got to constantly realign sensory space with motor space, and this is just an extreme example of that. Okay. Yes? Can you define thoughts, thought processes, how they occur, and their purpose? The purpose of, can I define the purpose of thought and what thought processes are? As opposed to oral language? Well, I think that th 
what's the difference between kind of the internal monologue in our head and an actual sentence that comes out of our mouth? How do you formulate a thought? Yeah. Well, I think they, those are, they are different, and this was a theme both in this book and in my previous book, The Language Instinct, that I don't think that we think in uh, complete English sentences or even necessarily in English words and, uh, and fragments at all. Uh, I think there's a, a variety of internal media, languages of thought, if you will, that include visual images and um, the kind of abstract content or gist or meaning beneath sentences, and that we do most of our reasoning in these nonverbal media just to plan our lives, to figure out um, how to, what we have to do next to make a cup of coffee or how we get to win friends and influence people, and we, with the knowledge of the laws of the world, we can try out in our head various courses of action and select the one that will get us uh, what we want, social or physical. Language is, I think, different. Language in the sense of stringing words together, making noise with your mouth, and that's the uh, communication channel. That's when we want to get a thought into someone else's head. So we code them as a stream of noise, expecting that the other person's brain has a circuit connected to the ear that can decode that noise back into some approximation of the thought that we had to begin with. So I think thought is a way of uh, reasoning, predicting, planning based on knowledge of the world. Language is a way of sharing thoughts uh, from one head to another. Take one more. Yes. I'm sorry, can you say that again? Well, the question is, is the mind, are the mind and the body a single entity? Um, well, yes and no. The mind, I mean, the mind is, I, I think, the information processing activity of the brain, and the brain obviously is part of the body. Uh, but I think the, um, and obviously we certainly feel as if we inhabit our entire bodies. Uh, when, you know, when we hit our finger with a hammer, the pain feels like it's in the finger, not in the head. Uh, on the other hand, the pain really is in the head, uh, even though it feels as if it's in the finger. That if you, um, it's only by virtue of the fact that the brain has all of these cables and fibers and sensors that saturate our skin and organs and muscles that we have the, our bodily feeling at all. We know this because in, say, amputees who have lost a limb, if the severed nerve fibers are uh, stimulated or if the parts of the brain that they connect to are spontaneously active, the amputee feels a, an amazingly vivid sensation of the vanished limb. Uh, it's called phantom limb. Sometimes in very precise detail, like the fingernails are digging into the palm, sometimes in, in um, agonizing pain. And um, I think that shows that, uh, and we also know that if you stimulate the brain with an electrode, people will vividly hallucinate uh, sensations in their body or visual images and so on. So uh, our own consciousness is a kind of in a sense, it's a kind of an illusion that we are in the world suffusing our bodies, um, but that in physically what's happening is that signals are being carried up to the brain and only when they're registered <coughs> in the brain do we have the experience of uh, our body, <coughs> excuse me, reacting to the world. And that's what can lead to um, illusions that people sometimes get of, pilots sometimes get this, of actually hovering above their body. Um, people sometimes have a, um, a feeling of leaving their body in a drug state and so on. And this is perfectly understandable if in reality consciousness is, uh, even consciousness of the body comes from the activity of the brain. 
I mean, the ultimate illustration of this is the scientific story in which um, also a philosopher's thought experiment in which, unbeknownst to you, in the middle of the night, evil neurosurgeons have come and uh, removed your brain from your skull while you were sleeping and are keeping it alive in a vat. Uh, hooked up to wires that are hooked up to a virtual reality computer, and that uh, it, right now, uh, I, for example, for all I know, might be a brain in, the vat, in a vat being fed signals that cause me to believe that I'm in a room talking to you. But this science fiction scenario is just a vivid illustration of the general point that it's what's happen, happening in the brain that counts. Okay, one more. I'm, This will be the last one for those of you who are getting nudgy. Yeah. What about the creationist uh, uh, argument that a, a, an organism like the eye requires so many precise parts, uh, all of them functioning together, that it couldn't have arisen as a sequence of uh, random mutations that were accumulated, but must be the product of intelligent design. I think that Darwin even dealt with that objection. He pointed out, first of all, that um, intermediate designs for eyes, ones without a uh, lens or without an iris uh, and so on can actually be found in simpler organisms and therefore would have been viable image formation devices uh, even in partial steps so that half an eye actually gives you vision that's half as good which is better than no vision at all. And this idea was recently cor corroborated by a computer simulation, kind of artificial life um, simulation that I, I write about in, the, um, in How the Mind Works, in which you could actually see this, the, an eye evolve on the computer screen by Darwinian principles. All you need is a sandwich of three layers of tissue uh, and mutations that change the transparency and thickness. Uh, and um, you can simulate the laws of Darwinian evolution and in something like 400,000 generations, uh, Re accumulation of helpful mutations will give you an eye out of a sandwich of tissue. Um, 400,000 generations is a lot by uh, the standards of our lives, but is actually trivial in terms of the uh, uh, timeline of evolution. So it certainly is a valid point that creationists bring up, but one that was answered uh, certainly uh, initially by Darwin and even more so by the modern simulations. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.